Welcome everyone to Trek Jitsu. My name is Paul and it's great to be bringing you one more episode in the journey of podcasting and life. Trek Jitsu is brought to you by Matrix. Matrix is a jujitsu streaming service with footage of sparring and uh, tournament footage and some other things that we are going to be adding over the next few months. If you would like to, go to youtube.com slash showyourrole and visit Matrix. We have tons of videos up there right now, and we are looking for more. So if you want to send in footage of yourself or anyone else sparring, maybe a total stranger, who knows? We would love to have that footage. So if you want to participate, go to wetransfer.com and use wetransfer to send the footage to matrixvideo at gmail.com. So that's how we are collecting footage, and we would love to have anything that you send in. So please go check us out again at youtube.com slash show your role. My guest today is Mike Johnson. Mike was my first instructor in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I first started training martial arts at Baltimore Judo Club in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was really into the judo program over there. And one day after practice, I saw that after the judo practice, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu class started, and at first I didn't know what it was. I was like, these guys are wearing purple belts, they have black geese, this is, this is a wild time. And um, I decided I was going to try it out because it looked really similar, and, you know, I was like, eh, more, more grappling, cool. So the next week I went, and Mike Johnson was the instructor. So Mike taught my first ever jiu-jitsu class and gave me my first jiu-jitsu beatdown and uh, has has uh, dished out many since that day. So Mike is one of the instructors at Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Maryland at this point in time, and he is also a black belt under Pedro Sauer and also a lieutenant in the Howard County Police Department in Howard County, Maryland. And Mike's a really great guy who has tons of experience in the martial arts, not just jiu-jitsu, and he's a fantastic instructor, along with being a awesome dude and a great police officer in Maryland. Please welcome Mike Johnson. Mike, what's up? Thanks a lot for being on the Trek JC show. Hey, man. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So how are things at the old academy these days? My sister has been stopping by there recently. Has she been like successfully beaten up and stuff like that? Uh, we we usually give her beatings to send back to you. I'm um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, things have been really busy there. Uh, class sizes have grown tremendously. Um, we've been doing uh, fight simulation classes every Thursday and Saturdays now, and we've got between like thirty and forty people in every one of those classes. Wow! So the mats packed. Um, everybody loves coming in when you can put the gloves on, and you've actually got to use your jujitsu to keep from being punched in the face. Um, it kind of makes it all that much more real. So uh, it's doing real well. Kids' classes are big. Um, Mike's looking at opening a, a third location. Um, so uh, it's been really successful there. He's killing it, Mike. Other Mike. We'll, we'll, we'll refer to Mike Stewart as Other Mike for the rest of the, yeah. the show. But um, he's killing it. Like, yeah, I th- you were talking about some high energy. That guy is non-stop high energy and uh he's not one that rests on his laurels like once once he got the the first school in clarksville open he started looking at the uh the place in finksburg 
and then he got that one open, and then he moved the one uh, in Clarksville to Columbia, and just you know quadrupled its its size. And uh, the last I heard, he was looking at opening another school, maybe in PA um, or Westminster, somewhere kind of out out in that area. So uh, yeah, he's killing it. I think one of the one of the things I tell like I think about a lot when I think about Mike Mike Stewart is he messages me at the most random times of the day because it will like I'll like bounce ideas off of him and then I'll get a message from him as I'm getting ready for work at like you know eight in the morning and I'll be like isn't it isn't it like two or three in the morning for you and <laughs> I get those same things like he'll he'll send something out on on <laughs> or nature, and I'll get it I gotta get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work but I look at when he's sending these things and I'm like dude it's like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning why are you awake thinking about this stuff but that's just uh that's the drive of an entrepreneur. And then um, and then I'll get a follow-up message from him like six hours later. He'll be like, okay, I'm going to sleep for the night. And then six yeah. six hours later, he's like, so we were, as I was saying before, I'm like, dude, like, <laughs> you own an <laughs> academy. Six hours ago. He's, he's very inspiring. Uh, really motivating guy. I'm sure he's listening to this being like, man, I'm going to, he's going to send me a message at like four in the morning and be like listen to the podcast is you know i I do i do sleep (laughs) (laughs) very briefly i think (laughs) when you're fueled on so much energy and passion your sleep uh requirements go down i think yeah significantly he's just he's got a tremendous work drive he's Um, a man a lot of ambition so he's great to be around he's a man um yeah what do you think it is about the academy that that we have that you have that I hope to come back to soon that uh, is so successful. Um, you know, I, I trained at a bunch of places, and so comparing it to the other schools, uh, you know, that I've trained and and taught at. Uh, first of all, the academy is absolutely beautiful. Mm. It's huge. Um, And it's clean. And that's one of the biggest things that I've seen going into other schools are, you know, a lot of them just look dingy. They look like, you know, they were just kind of thrown together real quick. You walk into the bathrooms and they're filthy. Um, You got guys, uh, you know, walking off the mats to the bathrooms barefoot and then back on the mats. Um, And that's not the case at all at our school um you know guy they, they clean those mats every single day there's strict rules you walk in there and you'll see a, a row of flip-flops all lined up right down the mat uh because that's so strongly enforced the cleanliness um everybody in there white geese you know the traditional white gee gives a sense of uniformity and cleanliness because i'll tell you man the guys come in in the black keys and the blue keys, and you can't tell whether they're dirty or not until you start rolling with that person. Mm-hmm. And then you smell the fact that they haven't washed their gi in a week or two. Um, and you don't get away with that with the white keys because mm-hmm. you can see whether they're clean uh, or dirty right away and, uh, and deal with it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we have s- such a collection of programs there. So, you know, you've got all the, the courses for the kids, uh, the bullyproof classes that they do for the kids. Um, you've got the uh, women's self-defense classes that they do. We've got the gi and no gi classes. We've got the no gi classes broken down into like sport jujitsu, and then we've got them broken down into uh, fight simulation classes where it's more MMA, um, self-defense oriented. Uh, no gi training and so it really offers a wide variety for anyone coming to look to train Uh, we've got guys that go and and they do competitions and they do really well you know for uh, those that are into that Uh, we've got guys who are military and law enforcement that come in um, and they want the jiu-jitsu for self-defense which is why I got into it 
then you've got you know the women who come in, and a lot of them will start off in the women's self defense classes, and then they migrate to you know the other gi and, and no gi classes once they get comfortable. So I, I find it's an easy way to bring people along the way the structure is set up there. Um, a lot of schools, you, you go in and uh, whatever's taught that night is just whatever is on the instructor's mind. There's no set curriculum. There's mm-hmm. no set theme. Whereas our school, each month, there's a different theme. So uh, this month, it's all back mount. Escape back mounts, attacks from the back mount, transitions to and from back mount. Uh, last month, it was all half guard. So we stick to six basic, basic themes that then, after six months, will repeat themselves. So the students really get uh, an entire month to work a position Mm -hmm. and really explore that position uh, with the gi, without the gi, with punches, without punches. Um, Every class we start standing. So it's a takedown or self-defense technique every single class uh, because what happens... Uh, you go to a tournament, both people walk onto the mat, they're both standing. Yeah. Uh, you're confronted uh, in a situation, whether it be in school, uh, on the street as a police officer, or in the parking lot of, of a mall or whatever, the fight starts standing. So you've got to be comfortable you know, in, in that range. Uh, so we've made it a, a priority to make sure that we teach uh, takedowns or, or standing self-defense, clinch work. Uh, at the beginning of every single class. Um, and then it goes into, you know, whatever our theme is for, for that month. Uh, and uh, it's really given some cohesion to the program. And everybody loves it. They love that four. So it's really been successful for us. Man, that, that's really cool. Um, that's a really cool way to do it. And... I know, like, when I was training there previously, you guys were still under the Gracie uh, uh, curriculum, and you had the cards, and you were teaching each class each day, and things like that, and it was it was a good program, I thought, but it definitely left some things out, I thought. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, for the, so Mike Stewart, he, he was initially under um, Huron and Henner. Uh, they were a certified training center, certified Gracie training center. And in doing so, you follow their format. So you've got your combatives cards, and each night, each class, it's structured to they're teaching this technique, and you mm-hmm. come in and you get your card checked off on and such. And that I think that format is great for beginners, people just starting jiu-jitsu. For sure. They get the most important techniques of jiu-jitsu that are going to make them the most ready to defend themselves as quickly as possible. And that worked out well, except then you got guys who are blue belts, purple belts, and brown belts. They want more. They're ready for more. Yeah. So you can't just keep teaching that same stuff over and over again and expect to grow your students or even retain your students. Mm-hmm. And there are some other issues uh, financially with that program. Mike made a financial call, and, and I think it was a, a very reasonable call. I mean, you got to look at how many students is this program bringing in versus how much are you paying to run that program. Yeah, for sure. I think Mike told me when he looked at the numbers, you know, being a certified training center, uh, only two people ever came in based off of him being a certified training center. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's just the juice isn't worth the squeeze at that point. However, we we like the format uh, and the structure. So, you know, we kind of just took the idea from Gracie University doing each month as a a theme. So you've got a month of mount, guard, half guard, side mount, back mount, and leg locks. And then it repeats. They actually have a a month for uh, stand-up techniques, but we didn't want to limit stand-up techniques to one month out of every six. Mm-hmm. So we felt like the uh, the standing techniques need to be done every single class so that you know when our guys go and compete, they, their takedowns are actually pretty decent as yeah. opposed to schools that don't, don't train takedowns until a tournament comes up or something. 
So that format's worked out real well for us. Um, the Crazy Combatives format was a good start. Uh, we still have attendance cards, so you know each time you come, you check off on your card so we can track your hours for uh, for stripes. And we are in the midst of putting together an official curriculum for blue belt and purple belt. Naki Syed and I and I've been working on that. It's just a matter of getting it all put together. We've already got basically all the techniques we want to put in there so that at a minimum, you have to know this mm -hmm. to get your belt. And you're going to be tested on this. Anything mm -hmm. above and beyond, great. So it's not limiting saying you can only know these techniques. It's saying this is the, the minimum that you have to know. You know, I, I've seen there's a lot of a controversy with testing and you know, I came up in traditional martial arts. I, I trained in Tung Soo Do and competed as a black belt in, uh, you know, karate tournaments uh, when I was training that. And you tested for belts. So you were given uh, a manual that told you what forms you had to know, what techniques, what kicks, what punches, all, and, and, you know, all this stuff that you had to know going into it. And so it was very structured. And then you, you tested. You know, they had specific times during the year that they would do belt tests. And uh, it ensured that you knew what you were supposed to know at that level and you could perform at that level. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of jujitsu schools, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, an instructor comes around and when they feel you're ready, you, you know, they give you a belt. So there's no real uh, consistency. There's no real curriculum. There's no real standard. Right. It's kind of like uh, if you went to college and they said, uh, all right. You're paying us to come to college. Just, you know, take whatever classes you want. And when we feel you're you're ready to graduate, we'll give you a diploma. Well, how do you go to college like that? Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And you know, I see some people whining about, wow, you know, people get nervous during tests and such. What kind of BS is that? You've been taking tests all your life in school and such. That's a part of reality. You take a test to get into the police department, you... You know, there's a written test, there's a physical test, and then, you know, a variety of other tests along the way. You go through a police academy, you got to take tests because you need to know motor vehicle law. You need to know criminal law. You got to know constitutional law. Would you hire a lawyer who went to law school but never took a test? Mm -hmm. it, that doesn't make any sense. You know, I've seen people who uh, were given belts that look more like uh, a belt of loyalty. Yeah. Than belt recognizing their level of skill mm -hmm. and then you got to think you got to think about this like i think long term you don't do any tests you give a guy a blue belt then you give a purple belt and then a brown belt and then you make them a black belt then they have their own students that come and they're teaching their own students how can you ensure they're teaching correct technique if you've never seen them test if, if you've never made them perform in front of you mm -hmm. and for small schools, it's not as big of a deal because the instructor is very connected to all the students. But when you get into like large schools and large associations where the instructor doesn't have as much one-on-one -on -one time with their students, then it becomes very questionable uh, when they're when they're handing out belts. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I I came up under Pedro Sauer. I tested for my blue belt. I tested for my purple, I tested for my brown, I tested for my black. None of those belts were ever just handed to me. Yeah, uh, You had to come in and you had to show uh, what you could do. And then there was live rolling, you know, at the end and such. And I think that's important. I think it's important to be able to hand someone day one a list of expectations. This is what you need to know to get your blue belt. And I think when you do that, you know, you give them focus you give them a uh, an objective, a goal, a set path, uh, versus just saying, "Yeah, just keep showing up, and when we feel you're ready, we'll we'll give you a belt." Mm -hmm. Even if you're not doing, you know, the most basic techniques correctly. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, we just base it based on how people roll." Well, people roll based on their strengths, not based on their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're, if you're like I'll just say, like you take uh, a guy who trains nothing but uh, leg locks. That's all he knew. Oh, no, I'm not even going to use that as an example. I'm going to use an example of someone I actually know. So I used to train with this guy. He had a great guard, like defensive guard. Mm -hmm. So everybody struggled passing this guy's guard. However, once you passed, 
that was the end of his game. He had no mount. He really had no guard offense. And uh, his, his escapes weren't very good. He, he was just really flexible with his legs, uh, really squirmy and explosive in, in defending his guard. And that's what he would rely on all the time. So he would never put himself in positions where he had to develop his weaknesses. So if you look at you know some higher level belt trying to pass this guy's guard, you'd be like, wow, that guy's really got uh, a great uh, guard retention. And if you were to promote him based on what you saw, you're neglecting to look at the fact that he doesn't have a well-rounded game. Mm-hmm. Like he has no uh, submissions from the mount. He has no escapes from back mount. He has no escapes from side control. He, I think at least when you do a test with the curriculum, you hold your students to a higher standard. And I have always found, as a uh, you know, I was a, a instructor at the police academy for several years. If you set a high expectation, you will get a high result. If you set a low expectation, you're going to get a low result. So I think by having a uh, a set curriculum and giving it to the student and making sure that they have the details of the techniques within that curriculum honed uh, and they know it, you're setting a higher expectation and you're going to get a a higher uh, caliber student. I think that's a very educated and great perspective on the whole subject of like when you give someone a belt and stuff like that. My issue with belt test was always... There was no interpersonal connection there. Like, so when I tested in judo, when I, because that's what I, I started in, you know, you would have, like, when I first got my, my first belt in judo, which was when I was 15, so it was like kids' belts. So I was testing for my orange belt. And we literally just had some people from, like, the commission. I don't even, I don't even know who they were show up at the gym. And then they gave me a little test. And then I pass, and they're like, all right, here's your orange belt. Have a great day. Here's a certificate saying that you're an orange belt. You know, good luck to you. And I was like, thanks. Appreciate it. Never saw him again. You know, but like my, so my issue, and then the same thing when I tested for my blue belt. We went to like a huge like convention in, blue belt in in judo. We went to like a huge convention where there were like a hundred people there. And they had like all these, all the local judo black belts there. And you would like go to one of these judo black belts and, you know, each person would test like five people and give them, you know, pass or fail. It was like a go or a no go at this station type of situation. And uh, and I was like, this is this is cool. You're making sure that I know the techniques, but I don't know these people. I will never see you again. And it just felt like very uh, I don't know. I didn't I didn't like it. So I like the. Yeah, I like the uh, the situation in jujitsu more because there's a connection between you and your teacher, and you have a mentor. But I think well, maybe, that yeah, maybe there's a maybe there's a connection there. I mean, you know, some of these uh, guys have associations that are so large um, that they don't see their instructor very regularly. Yeah, exactly. And and so there's gonna be there's gonna be that that uh, disconnect with some schools. You know, Helson comes and he visits our school several times a year, doing seminars. His son, Holland, was uh, just there two weeks ago, did a phenomenal seminar. You know, you got Tony Waldecker, uh, who's one of Helson's fourth degree black belts. He's in the school every Wednesday, and and, uh, Kyle Spendeth is is teaching. He's one of Helson's black belts, teaching up in Finksburg every week. So in those situations, you know, it's, it's much more personable. It's not like guys are just going to a jiu-jitsu tournament and, uh, you know, the IBJJF, you know, commission is just handing out, uh, handing out belts. Yeah, for sure. So I could, I could totally get that. Being handed the belt might come off as being a little impersonal after you've taken a test. But it doesn't degrade the accomplishment. You know, I think uh, when I went to college, you know, you, you have college professors as you go through and you take their course and you pass their course and then you continue on and eventually you're going to be handed a college degree by the dean um, or whoever who you've never taken a single class with. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't diminish the value or the meaning of the hard work and dedication and sacrifice you put in 
to obtain that degree. And I think it's the, uh, the same way with, uh, with the belt. I mean, you put in the hard work in judo. You were the one that put in the, the early mornings uh, on the mat, the sweat. You were the one that sacrificed, you know, going out and hanging out with friends so you could go to class or so that you could get up the next morning and go train. Um, so the fact that the belt's awarded to you by someone that you're, you know, you're not exactly real familiar with doesn't diminish the value of that belt, uh, or basically not, not even of the belt, but of what you put into your training right. and put into yourself and your self development, which is the most important thing. You know, I came up in a, in a small school, so I had a lot of, you know, the instructors that gave me my belts, you know, when I was growing up were there teaching me every single night. So not only did I have a structured test, but it came from the instructor that was teaching me every single night. So I, I got to have the best of both worlds, you know, right. as, as that went. Yeah, I just, I just see it's too easy for uh, some people to rely on their strengths and get ahead and not develop their weaknesses. And, you know, they're getting their belts because they're winning tournaments using, uh, you know, they, like I'll use an example as uh, some guy who wrestled all through high school and college. And then he starts jiu-jitsu as a white belt and he goes to a tournament, competes in gi or no gi and destroys everybody. Right. So are you, you're giving him a blue belt because he, he got takedown, he got points on takedowns against yeah. all these guys and, and uh, that were white belts. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. What, what does he know about jujitsu? Well, how is his jujitsu technique? We already know he's a great wrestler. We know he's got great takedowns. We know he's got great control from the top. Uh, how good is he on his back? How good, you know, is he with his submission defense um, or, or whatever? So I just feel like if you're going to award a belt, it needs to be based on part of it needs to be based on that person's knowledge and proficiency in the techniques because somewhere down the line that person is going to be teaching and if their techniques and the details of their techniques are lacking that's what they're going to teach and then you've kind of degraded the efficiency of jujitsu you know as it continues on down the line hmm. uh, so that's just my opinion as far as belt testing and you know awards for for belts i mean i've seen guys who would go compete and they were given a belt afterwards uh even if they didn't necessarily win i saw one guy he won because he had two matches one was a draw and the other one was a disqualification and boom his instructor hands him a, a belt and it was part of a, an association uh so it wasn't even like that's his instructor that he's training with every day that's just one that he sees maybe twice a year yeah, uh, and uh, it kind of blows my mind. And I've seen, you know, I've seen black belts who don't know any any self defense. And you you ask them, you know, you look at what they are they're testing on, and I said, uh, what uh, where's your self defense in your curriculum? And they're like, oh, we, I don't know any. Holy crap! You got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and you don't know any self defense. You're not teaching your students any self defense. It, it just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. And I know there's this big there's always this big to do about sport jujitsu or self defense jujitsu. You know, you're going to train for what you want to train for. You got to keep in mind that jujitsu is supposed to be for everyone. Everyone that wants it. If you have, if you're, if you've only focused on sport jujitsu and you've got a woman who comes to your school who is a victim of a sexual assault, you know, they want to learn how to defend themselves. Your response shouldn't be, well, then you need to go train Krav Maga or you need to go train something else. Yeah. No. Jiu-Jitsu is perfect for this person if you know the self-defense to teach them. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of instructors that don't know that or they don't teach it uh, on a regular basis uh, or maybe they, they never learned it so they're not comfortable teaching it. But you got a, a, a kid who's getting bullied in school you know, they come in here, they want to start training jujitsu so they can learn to defend themselves. You know, what are you going to tell that kid? Well, you know, here, let me teach you some lasso guard and let me teach you some, some worm guard and, and this. And, you know, maybe in about 
five or seven years, you'll be good enough to defend yourself as long as someone's not trying to punch you in the face. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've got guys, guys come visit our school from uh, other places like blue, purple, and brown belts, and they'll come in on the nights that we do the fight simulation training. They get destroyed. Yeah. And you see, like, they'll come in and they'll stand there in, like, a, like a wrestler stance, and they're getting jabbed in the face. And I'm like, man, do, do something. Either take your shot or get away. Don't stand there and keep getting punched in the face. Mm-hmm. I had a guy about a month or so ago came in. He put the gloves on. He tried to do spider guard and was on his back trying to play the spider guard with me, and I was just punching him in the face repeatedly. He just curled up into a fetal position. And th- this guy was a purple belt. And, you know, talking to him afterwards, he's like, I've never trained anything like that. I've never I've never done any kind of training where I had to defend against punches. I've never done any kind of takedowns where a guy was throwing punches at me. The purple belt in jiu-jitsu. Uh, I see that a lot with, with uh, people coming from other schools, come to visit our school. They've never done any kind of training like that. And uh, it's a, a huge eye-opening experience for them. And, you know, we're not there to try to, like, beat anyone up. Yeah. You know, the point of that fight simulation training is to make you aware of where you're vulnerable and to make sure that you can switch from a sport game to a self-defense game and that you're getting both. Um, because I love the sport of jiu-jitsu. I love the, you know, all, you know the... The, the chess match, the physical chess match of the sport jiu-jitsu, and it's so much fun, and it's so creative, but you got to be able to keep it real when someone's trying to hurt you, and if you don't train for that, you are not going to be prepared for it uh, when and if it ever happens. You know, it, it's just uh, it's kind of disappointing when you see, you know, a lot of these schools that uh, aren't teaching it and kind of doing a real disservice to their students. I mean, I noticed in our school... Our biggest classes are always the fight simulation classes. Mm. Love that class. I mean, you know, we've had, you know, I talk about like these people who have been victims of crimes coming in to train. Like, that's real. Like, we have students at our school who have been victims of sexual assaults. They've been victims of bullying. They're police officers that have to make arrests and put their hands on people. Uh, and, you know, these, these people have fought them and, you know, you know, trying to hurt them. You know, they're, they're coming to you to learn, to defend themselves. I think you have an obligation to be able to teach them how to defend themselves. And you should be able to do it, you know, relatively quickly. It shouldn't take you, you know, five, six years before you've acquired enough jujitsu knowledge and comfort to, you know, be effective. Six months and you should be pretty solid. I think that a lot of what you've said today goes back to like uh, systems, you know, curriculums and things like that. I think that's something a lot of schools don't have. They don't have a system. They don't have these numbers like six months till you are ready to defend yourself on the streets, you know, yeah. things like that. And I think that's uh, a big problem. Yeah, it comes down to, you know? to setting goals and objectives. Without that, you know, you just kind of show up. And let the wind blow your boat wherever it blows your boat. It takes organization and, you know, it takes a lot a lot of thought. You know, that's how I was brought up. So it's always been very comfortable for me. You know, I've, I've seen people who, you know, they, they come in, they get their check mark on their card in class. And, you know, it's with the Pedro Sauer, you had to have uh, 100 classes per stripe on a belt. So basically 500 classes between belts. Mm-hmm. And that was minimum. That doesn't mean like you get all your classes and then all of a sudden here, here's your belt. That means this minimum you have to have before you're allowed to test for your belt. I think uh, the way some places do now, it's, uh, okay, you got your classes, um, here's, your, here's your belt. Well, you know, some people learn at different rates and some people are going to progress. Some people are, uh, you know, more naturally athletic. Uh, they pick up things and put things together a little bit faster. And uh, it doesn't change the fact of whether you either know the technique uh, that you should know or you don't know the technique that you should know. Um, And I think when you do a test and sit there and watch them, it shows a retention. I mean, you can teach a technique, watch someone do the technique in class, and be like, okay, they got that technique. Well, they got that technique right now. Will they have it tomorrow? Mm. Will they have it a week from now? So it's not just a matter of, okay, I got the technique now. It's uh, how long can you retain this technique? 
And are you retaining the most important stuff in order to defend yourself? You know, if you're ever, uh, if you ever find yourself with someone in your house or, you know, you're attacked on the street or you're being pushed against a locker in a, a school hallway um, or you're being picked up and dragged to be put in a car on some street or something or on a mall parking lot. I think uh, it really emphasizes the importance to not just train but to study and practice the technique because it's all too often, you know, you teach a technique, guys come in, they do it, you know, three or five times and then they sit there waiting for the next technique. And that, that's kind of a pet peeve of mine because I look at those guys and I'm like, what are you guys, masters already? Give me a fucking break. Get back to work. You guys shouldn't even be slowing down. You should be training this technique until I tell you stop training this technique. You know, if there's no no pressure to have to have this technique memorized and ingrained, then they they don't put as much priority on it. Yeah. I think what um, the way Pedro Sauer does it is great because there's that perfect there's that mix of like a interpersonal connection like I was mentioning before and also a test. Like yes. when he came to our old the old school that we used to train at and he did the blue belt test for me. I had never met him before. But he came and he did a test for me and he like, you know, had a conversation with me and I could tell like, yes, he's traveling around, he's busy, he has a big association. But like, if I went to his school, like if I decided right then and there, this is my master, I want to follow him and study under him. And I showed up at his school and I was like, hey, man, you gave me a blue belt. I'd like to train under you now. He would be like, yeah, come in. You're you're my student yeah. now, you know, like there would be that connection if I wanted it. If I wanted to seek him out, he would be there. And I feel the same is true with Helson. Like if any of the, our students at the school went to Helson and said, hey, I want to study with you personally, can you take me in? He would be like, yeah, of course, come come tomorrow. You know, if, if they wanted to like pick up and move their life and train with that person. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and Pedro is such an amazing uh, individual. He's often referred to as the ambassador mm -hmm. of jujitsu. Uh, he doesn't get into the politics of uh, between schools or between different lineage. Uh, you know, he would do his summer camps. I mean, he had Eduardo Tellis out at a, a summer camp, Andre Galval, these other guys from different schools, and, and he didn't care. He had the, the Mendez brothers out at his school at one point. Ryan Hall was out there uh, for a seminar at one point. And there was, there was no politics with him. Yeah. You know, he's, he's been great to me. Um, he's so personable, and uh, he just has such a love for the art and such a depth of knowledge. Um, you know, here's a guy that's training with all the original Gracie brothers since, you know, he was a kid and uh, came up with, with Helio and, and Hickson and Helson and Horian and Hoyce and Holker. And, you know, the, it was just amazing. So he's, he's been great. Yeah, and anytime you show up at his school, I mean, he treats you like, you know, you're one of his kids. Hey, so good to see you. Come on in. Yeah. Let's do and That's great. Yeah. So. I think you've got to have the mix. You know, you've got to have standardization and tests in a curriculum, but you also have to have that, like, student-teacher relationship. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen some guys, like, and this kind of disappoints me where I see some people who put a lot of hard work into bettering themselves and, and getting to that next level and they get their blue or their purple belt. And then I see some other people who don't put in near as much effort or work and they get handed the same belt. And I really think it kind of cheapens, you know, the accomplishments of the other people that kind of came before them. So uh, I think, you know, you have one standard and a test. Then it's easy to say, hey, look. You didn't pass. You you messed up all this stuff, and you're not ready for your belt. Now you know what you got to do, and you go back to the drawing board, as opposed to someone coming up, and this is kind of starting to become more prevalent nowadays of, of people saying, hey, when, when am I going to get my next belt? When am I going to get my next stripe? You know, what do you tell them? Uh, well, you're just not ready yet. Well, why, why? Why aren't I ready? Well, I don't, because I said you're not ready. Yeah, you should be able to. You know, it's on the instructor to, to tell the student whether they're ready to, to proceed or not. But it makes you sound more intelligible when you can say you're not ready because of this. 
you don't know these techniques or you're not performing these techniques, you're missing details on these techniques, this is why this is important. So go back and keep training. And I just think that uh, it kind of makes it uh, a little bit more professional, more structured. Like I said, it gives people a, a goal and an, an objective to shoot for. And it's a very clear path as opposed to, well, I just keep showing up and hopefully good things will come to me. So you talked earlier about like developing a, tr- a curriculum for like blue belts and purple belts and things like that. What types of things are you putting into like the, the purple belt curriculum? So uh, I, Pedro Sauer has a, a white to blue curriculum yeah. and a blue to purple curriculum. And so we took all of that we made sure that the white to blue curriculum included all the stand-up self-defense, weaponless self-defense. Uh, blue to purple would include all the stand-up club defenses. Purple to brown would be all the knife defenses. And then brown black would be all the gun disarms. Um, it's just kind of an idea of where we put the self-defense stuff in. And then so it's basically like Pedro's curriculum from white to blue and Uh, blue to purple, plus we added some additional stuff in there from each of the main positions that we teach, you know, for each month. So we added some uh, back escapes, we added some half guard passing, some uh, half guard sweeps, some uh, judo takedowns. Uh, We made sure that everybody knows like uh, double and single leg, uh, takedowns and defense. And so we've kind of got all that covered uh, Naki's working on putting it into a uh, a format that then we can print it out and give it to each student whenever they sign up and say, "Here, this is what this is what you need to know." You know, then you know they can look at it and they can come into class and after class they can grab some of the people they're training with and say, "Hey, I need to work on these techniques," or they can get a private with one of the instructors and say, "Hey." Uh, I need to know this for my test, and we haven't done this in a while. Uh, you know, get a private and go over this stuff. We thought it would be a good idea if we put the techniques that we're covering from the curriculum up on a board so that the instructor, each instructor coming in each night would know what the instructor of the night before covered. Hmm, yeah. What else needs to be covered. So just trying to organize our, our teaching to make it more methodical to kind of get a, a better result. Um, or a higher result, if you will. Yeah, like what uh, what gets measured gets managed, things like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I said, you know, going through, I was instructor at the police academy for three years. You know, we had a defensive tactics program that we teach the recruits. Right. Well, we have to have all that documented to show what we're teaching and when we taught it and what training objectives we covered and such uh, because we're audited. And you can't just have these police recruits come in and say, okay, well, I'm going to teach, you know, such and such today just off the top of my, my head. Right. Uh, and tomorrow, I don't know what, what I'll cover on. I'll pick something to work on. Like you, you, you can't, you can't run an organization like that. Yeah. It just makes sense to put some more structure in the curriculum and the way things are run. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a really great way to do things. And I'm glad that you are doing, like a month by month cycle. So when you're doing that, do you like, I, I mean, obviously jujitsu is with the whole body. So like you focus on one thing, but you're also including other techniques as well. Like that transition, you know, like, yeah, yeah. So, uh, this month is uh, back mount, right? The other night I taught a back mount transition from the mount and then how to uh, apply uh, pressure to break them down once you got the back mount and a submission off of it. That's what it'd be like all month long. Just uh, escapes from the back mount, submissions from the back mount, control from the back mount, transitioning. You know that includes turtle, uh, turtle positions because that's that's on the back. Breaking down turtle. You know it's, it's all of that. So the focus is all just attacking and defending and transitioning on uh, controlling the back you know afterwards guys when they stay up and roll you work on whatever you want to work on but at least with that it keeps everybody kind of focused and in a lot of time in that position to really delve into it to break it down and to uh experiment you know Pedro Sauer talks about uh the mat being the lab 
Yeah. And you come in to do your training and you're conducting experiments and you're going to find things that work and find things that don't. And that's all part of, you know, experimenting in the lab. Giving these focus months really allows uh, the students to really study that position all month long and what's possible from there and really build their repertoire up before they move on to uh, a month of, you know, leg locks, which is next month. What do you guys focus on in leg lock month? What are you going to, what are you excited to show? So, you know, it's <laughs> the challenge is you've got guys who are day one students and then you got guys that are, are brown belts in the class. Right. Usually we try to break the class up into blue belts and above and then, you know, the white belts uh, because we're not teaching the white belts heel hooks. We're not teaching them any kind of uh, techniques, you know, where the knee's being reaped. We basically just keep it really simple for them. And then we'll go in and, and work, you know, the, the other stuff with the, uh, the blue belts and above. Next month, uh, kind of, you know, it depends really who shows up for class. You know, if it's a lot of beginners and just a, a couple blue belts, then, you know, we'll focus more on the straight leg locks, straight ankle locks, and some setups you know to, to enter into those uh if it's a class that we can break it up you know then we'll work on you know rolling toe holds um rolling calf crushers uh set us from de la Hiva. tony uh waldecker showed this great defense against the de la Hiva guard that uh was like uh, a straight ankle lock standing mm-hmm. and it was so quick i was just like oh that's that's a money technique right there don't even bother passing de la Hiva guard just submit them while they go for it i know it's probably hard to do uh, over audio but what what kind of did it entail <laughs> tony hooked the if you've got your left hand and left leg set up in the de la Hiva guard and your right leg is basically your push leg. Okay, yeah. He attacks the push leg. And he almost does like, it was almost like a rear naked choke on that push leg. And he just snatches it up so quick and lifted. It's like you're locked in and you're going nowhere. And uh, he showed it to me at, at the seminar Holland did. And uh, I loved it. I've been going in trying to find the guys that like to play the De La Hiva yeah. just so I can practice it on them. You know, kind of figure things out, figure out the timing and, you know, exactly where I got to put the pressure. So we'll play around with that. Tony's such a, uh, Tony Waldecker, he, he's such a encyclopedia of like he's old a, school, Hells and Gracie, dirty jujitsu. He's a like, wizard. Yeah, the neck cranks and the, uh, the leg locks and foot locks. I love getting together with him. He does his classes just so I can kind of pick his brain on things. And everything he shows, none of it's like complicated. It's all very simple, direct, and devastating, which is what I really enjoy. You know, it's that old school Helson. Yeah, Jiu-Jitsu. I like a lot of his stuff. I use his uh, neck cranks regularly. Yeah. Regularly, I try to go for it. it uh, I, I almost never get it because people here know it. People here, and they love like uh, neck cranks, but it's perfect for me to set up other things. And that's like yeah. where a lot of those quote unquote dirty submissions come in is like people know, even if they're not necessarily going to work because like people say like, Oh, neck cranks, it's not going to work. People like muscle out of it or something. But like, I don't know, they, they work just fine. And also they, they work to set up other things, you know, like, like the, yeah. Mo- yeah. Let, let Tony Waldecker grab you in a couple of the neck cranks he knows and see if you're going to muscle out. Of you're those. for sure not. Um, 100% not. <laughs> oh, no. You're going to get your neck stretched. Or, uh, um, yeah. Or your, your spine cracked. One or the other. You're going to get a nice free chiropractic treatment at the very least. You know, it's great to have in your toolbox. <laughs> Just like any submission, you know, sometimes uh, you got a guy that's kind of unique. Maybe they know what's coming. You go for the one submission. But you really don't go for it. Like, that's your setup for what you really want. Right. And that's where the chess master match of, and I tell guys, like, I was guys and, you know, they think I want one thing and I get something else. And they're, like, scratching their heads afterwards and they're like, I thought for sure you were going for the arm bar. And I said, well, that's that's what I wanted you to think. Right. I said, I didn't want the arm bar at all. I wanted this inverted triangle. It's just a matter of setting up your techniques. You know, a boxer comes in. And they have combination. Uh, the idea is not to knock you out with the first punch of the combination. It's to get you with the last punch of the combination. You know, in jiu-jitsu, we need to think the same way. What can you do instead of telegraphing 
the arm bar by pulling on this guy's arm and letting him know exactly what you want. What can you do to make him think you want something else that will make him not want to defend his arm, make him think of defending something else that will leave, then leave his arm exposed, and then you get it, and then you get your submission. So it's always better to go the indirect route and you know set up your techniques and to just try to you know go for it right off the bat. And if you can use neck cranks um, or whatever to kind of bug someone to make them open up, then great, use it to bug them and make them open up. I love it. I love the way stringing different moves together and things like that. That's something that you're very good at. I always end up somewhere that I never thought I would be when we're rolling together. <laughs> um, oh, I meant to say at the beginning, but one of the chokes that you showed me, like the last time that we were to, that we trained together, it was like your choke from north south, where in the gi, where you like walk, you're in north south, and then you walk back to side control and you trap one of their arms, and then you go underneath and you grab like a five finger grip in the in the collar, and then you do a bread cutter choke on the other side. Do you know what I'm talking about? You might not. Maybe it was something that you were just playing around with for that specific day. But that's become like my favorite choke. And um, I let you down. I went for it in a tournament yesterday and it didn't work. But back to... Uh, back, was, it gear, was it a gear or no gi choke? Right? It was in the gi. In the gi. But uh, it's become one of my favorites. So I like that a lot of like misdirection where you make them think you're going for something from like north-south and then you walk back to side control and really you're going for something else. So it's awesome. Yeah, and with the gi, it, it really allows you to do a lot more of that because you have so many parts of the gi to use, to play with, to set stuff up. I really enjoy the gi game. It gives you a lot more options. It gives you a lot more opportunities to be creative and experiment and such. And it's all fun. I've got to go, unfortunately. But thanks so much for doing this this podcast. It's been really great. We'll have to do another one sometime. Hopefully, uh, oh, yeah. hopefully Next live. Time we'll, we'll talk about... Uh, We'll talk about self-defense and law enforcement. Yeah, for sure. We didn't even touch on that. But yeah. part two. So, yeah, so much stuff going on nowadays with uh, police issues of force and it's so heavily scrutinized. I know there's a lot of people who have questions about why police officers react the way they do in certain use of force situations. And there's a lot of they have questions about the actual training that police officers receive. You know, uh, I think it would be a great topic to discuss and kind of enlighten people on the actual training they receive or don't receive and uh, I think it would really kind of shock a lot of people that uh, police officers aren't generally as prepared for a combative situation as one might think. Well, let's talk about it because now we've started talking about it so let's talk about it for a minute. Like what right. what, what do you mean specifically? Like, There's no standard. Hmm. No federal standard for defensive tactics training in law enforcement. In Maryland, where I'm a police officer, there's training objectives that have to be met by the Maryland Police Training Commission for each uh, department as far as uh, their defensive tactics training goes. But they're so minimum. Basically, police officers get roughly 80 hours at best. And this is only in the jurisdiction that, that I work. Get about 80 hours of defensive tactics training. It's nothing. That's it. It's nothing. Yeah. So that's like, what, a first stripe white belt? Yeah, if that. Yeah, if that. And that, that includes, you know, they got to go through ASP training, their ASP baton training. Um, Pepper spray. OC, yeah. OC spray training. And so you think that that's what they get. And then once they're out of the academy, police officers only get two to three hours of in-service training on defensive tactics a year. So think of how good... Uh, would you be if you did 80 hours of jujitsu training and then once a year you did two or three hours? Yeah, it's, it's pathetic. Like you, you yeah. have no training. You, you don't yeah. train. You don't train at all. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. But people have this misconception like police officers come out of the academy like they're Steven Seagal. Yeah, no. Or, you know, they, they're black belts or something. And that's not the case at all. And, you know, the fact is not all police officers are created equal and you have some that are ready for battle and some that aren't. I mean, you know, there was a, a saying, uh, a military saying, if you take 100 men into battle, 10 don't even belong there. Yeah. 80 are nothing but targets. Nine are actual fighters and one 
is the guy that or or woman that's going to lead you to victory. And it's the same thing with law enforcement. Being a police officer doesn't make you a badass. It doesn't make you an ass kicking machine. Um, you get a minimal amount of defensive tactics training, and then you're put out on the street and expected to deal with people who are high on drugs or high on emotion that want to fight um, or that want to kill you. And then you're heavily scrutinized uh, because of the amount of force you had to use to overcome um, this aggressor. And a lot of people just don't understand how little training police officers actually get. And It's, uh, it's and here, ridiculous how little they oh, it get. Is. It is. And, you know, I hear stuff like, well, they should they should have to train every single week. Well, if you're going to put police officers in and have them training uh, several hours every week, uh, that means that they're not going to be available to come to your house to take your burglary report or to come and help you after you've just been robbed or, you know, to come and stop your husband from beating you up, you know, during a domestic assault. And that's not realistic. In a lot of agencies, there's no physical fitness test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's one to get in, to get hired, and then that's it. You're never tested again after that. So you could go through the academy and in several years you could gain 100 pounds and be completely fat and out of shape. And there's no standard for that. And you just you go on and you do your job as a, as a police officer with no additional, you know, training other than the, you know, couple hours you get once a year. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, people don't, uh, they don't quite understand a lot of that. Very few police officers that I know actually train outside of what they're given in the police department. Yeah. Very few. Like, yeah. uh, I've got a, an agency of over, it's like 480 sworn officers. I think that's about where we are. And uh, there's probably about four or five of us out of all of them that actually train. Yeah. Wow. So, and yeah, then, it is. Yeah, you hear that and you're like, yeah. wow. I know. That's, and yet we're expected to go out there and handle these situations. And uh, a lot of people just don't understand that uh, that police officer is really not that much more prepared, you know, than the average person. So, uh, you might be sick of like other country comparisons because the United States is very unique. And I, I don't know, but I have a friend who is a police lieutenant in Norway and he's a jujitsu purple belt, really nice guy. And, um, I like what they do in Norway for, I mean, obviously Norway is very different than the United States. So let's start yeah. with that. But what they do in Norway, you have three years of police academy, three years of training. Um, and then after you're done with your three years of hard, like really intense training, it sounds, sounds like then you have one year of shadowing a police officer. So all you're doing is ride alongs, seeing them do their job for, for a whole year. So you basically just follow, you get assigned to one guy and he's like your mentor and you just follow him around for a year and see what he does. And yeah. that that's controversial. A lot of Norwegians think that they should have four or five years of training. And Holy yeah, and um, yep. we'd have no police officers on the road if that were the case. So, right. <laughs> um, in in Maryland, you go through a uh, a thirty two week academy. Then you have three and a half months of field training. Mm-hmm. Then after that, then you're out on your own on the road. Yeah, and um, um, I feel like there has to be somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between, like four years and you know. A, the the problem is, summer. you have to be able to keep up with the rate of retirement yeah. and recidivism. So right now, our department uh, is down several vacancies. Mm. If we had to wait four years to fill those. You, we'd be working with probably half the number of police officers that we need to have in order to be uh, effective. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I like the idea of more training, but it's I guess it's just a matter of what kind of training are you giving them that's going to make them 
that much more prepared. Yeah. Um, the majority of our job is pretty non-confrontational. We don't have a lot of use of force incidents. However, when we do, you know, you got to, you know, they're very highly scrutinized and you got to look at is the training ad- adequately preparing these officers for these confrontations. Yeah. You know, you look at a lot of the, the cases that are popping up in the U.S. with uh, officer use of force, and in some cases the use of force is appropriate, and in other cases it's not. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, they don't understand why these police officers aren't more trained. And it's just like there's so much in our job that we're required to do on a, on a daily basis, the use of force incidents because there are so many, not from, because there's so many things that you normally have to do uh, that you're going to use daily that require training. Yeah, um, and those are kind of given priority. Uh, and again, you know, when there's no when there's no minimum physical fitness, when there's no uh, and you know, when I was teaching at the academy, every time uh, they uh, the administration wanted to uh, implement a new class into the academy. The first thing that got taken out was defensive tactics. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. PT. It's the first thing to go when something new is introduced, and like that's the that's the mindset. They don't see it as being as important. Like I said, when I got over there, uh, they were doing about eighty hours of DT training with the recruits. And I got that bumped up to about 120 hours. And every free moment we had, we were practicing handcuffing or some sort of defensive tactics. And every time a class was canceled, great. It's either PT or defensive tactics that yeah. we're going to use to, to fill that time. Um, but now they, tr- they squeeze so much into you know these 32 weeks of academy training um, that a lot of the defensive tactics – get squeezed out yeah uh, and it's really does the greatest disservice to the officers that you're gonna put out on the street and expect to handle these volatile confrontations uh yeah it's just a, it's a matter of priorities and uh training expectations really i think that that's a perspective a lot of people need to understand is you know the amount of training that's really given, the priorities and the reality. Like you said, people say, yeah, we need more training. Let's extend police academy. And then you have to understand there's, you know, second, third, fourth orders of effect that happen because of that. You know, yes. like, yeah, if you extend the police academy an extra year, that might be great. You might have more well-trained police officers, but then there's other things you have to take into account. Like yes. what you were just talking about. So there's a yeah, lot more to it. These that go empty. Yeah, and, and then you also have to look at what uh, what defensive tactics that police department is using. Exactly, like what are they actually what, being taught? Yeah, with Howard County, we've been doing uh, the Gracie uh, survival tactics, and when I first came on, it was called Grapple, Gracie Resisting Attack Procedures for Law Enforcement. Hmm. So for 20 years, our police department has been using that as their That's primary awesome. tactic system. And uh, then we started using crowd a little bit more back to the uh, Gracie survival tactics but a lot of agencies you know aren't using any of that like some of them are just doing boxing um, yeah. some of them are doing Aikido some of them are doing Krav Maga and having gone through the Krav Maga force training program for law enforcement as an instructor the emphasis is on beating your suspect into submission yeah that's not uh, wise complete, no which is the complete opposite of what you know, Gracie Jiu Jitsu teaches. So it's, you know, it's all about overwhelming this person with force as opposed to using just enough force to control the situation and, you know, get the person in handcuffs without hurting yourself or without hurting them. You know, part, part of that is what kind of training the officer's receiving, the, the mentality of that training. Yeah. And the focus that's going to have an impact on uh, how they respond to. A, uh, a physical confrontation or an emotional confrontation that eventually is going to turn physical. Some departments don't teach verbal de-escalation. 
So uh, we do verbal judo, uh, and, you know, teaching the recruits to, you know, verbally de-escalate these situations before they become something physical. So that's one of the things that, you know, police officers all are on with, and they can only deal with these situations to the extent that they're trained. Some of these jurisdictions, they're smaller jurisdictions, they can't afford the kind of training the, the large jurisdictions can. They, don't, they yeah. can't run the same kind of academy classes the large jurisdictions can. And that's going to impact the, the service that they're able to provide and the, the uh, preparedness of the police officers that they're putting out there on the street. And it's one of the things, it's a hot topic button nowadays. And uh, it's getting a lot of attention. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have opinions on it, but it's just because they have no idea uh, about the training that uh, police officers actually receive. Um, and, and the continuing training, because that's as important, you know, defensive tactics is a perishable skill. For sure. If you don't practice, you're going to lose it, just like shooting. And, uh, you know, two or three hours a year of training isn't enough to maintain proficiency. It's not enough to maintain your confidence um, in your skill. Um, and what happens when you get into a physical confrontation and you don't have that confidence, you tend to overreact. Um, when you're that skill is not so ingrained in you that it becomes automatic, then you've got to slow down and think, and then things become uh, more chaotic and, and, uh, and less controlled. Yeah, it's something that, uh, that a lot of police departments struggle with. I think that, if anything, Howard County is doing well. You know, like, I feel like our program was pretty good. As, uh, compared to others, you know, compared to others yeah. that I've heard yeah. where... They're doing at best Krav Maga or Aikido or something like that. Like yeah. doing something How- resembling to Gracie Jiu Jitsu is definitely the best. Yes, Howard County's always always been ahead of the curve. Um, we don't have a lot of the same issues that other uh, have. Uh, we've always been pretty well funded. Uh, we've always had really strong support from our community. And we've had a lot of instructors at the academy who are forward thinkers and, uh, you know, provide a high quality of training. Yeah. Um, However, it's really only a matter of time before, you know, where things can turn very badly very quickly. Right. So one situation can change the entire momentum and change uh, the entire public perception. And uh, like I said, and I've seen guys, you know, they, they're not training, they're not taking care of themselves, they're not eating well, they're not exercising, and they're not prepared for the physical confrontation. And, and when it comes, because it's not a matter of if, it's always a matter of when, mm-hmm. yeah, they're going to they're gonna have some problems. And, uh, you know, there's a good chance uh, that it's not going to go well. It's one of the, the things that we... Uh, you know, we, we have to be mindful of and we've got to stay on top of. And I just had, uh, we just did our defensive tactics training for in-service this past week. And uh, you look at the amount of information that's given. You know, you have the guys practice the technique a few times and then you move on to the next technique. And I'm thinking, you know, this is nice. It's nice for to cover, you know, liability to say that we're providing this training. Yeah. But how effective is practicing a technique three times once a year going to be? Imagine if you were had a jiu-jitsu tournament and your coach was like, how much have you been preparing? You were like, well, I had uh, three hours of training uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then you go compete. Yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that's a great way to, to, to think about it. Um, and the problem is, you know, for a police officer – the, the tournament can happen any day we go to work. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, what I'm getting at. We go to work. So. And it's a tournament where there's knives and punches and guns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and maybe three or four opponents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you're going to be put under a lot of stress because there's not going to be a referee that's going to call time. Right. <laughs> save you if you're in a bad position. You're kind of on your own. Yeah. So, yeah, so you think of like, Guys who, you think about the last time you competed, like the butterflies in your stomach, 
as you're walking onto the mat for a competition, man, you got a referee in there. You got a guy in there who doesn't want to hurt you. He just he wants to win a medal. You want to win the medal, and the referee is going to be there to try to make sure that uh, you guys uh, are safe and and you guys have rules. Mm-hmm. Now think about the police officer who goes in, and you're in weight class. You like you compete in your own weight class, yeah. right? Now you think about the police officer who goes up against the guy who's bigger, younger, maybe stronger, more athletic than they are. Uh, there's no referee to bail that police officer out. Uh, the police officer has to follow rules, but the person he's going against doesn't have to follow any rules. Yeah. Or the person he's going against doesn't care about the rules, which is why the police officer is there to begin with. The only training that police officer had was, you know, several years ago or five or ten years ago when they went to the academy. And once a year, they got uh, two hours of practicing techniques. And no that's a, rolling, just yeah. practicing techniques. And that's assuming that they went to a, they have a good county, like Howard County, yeah, where they're yeah, even yeah, doing that's it. Assuming they, they even got, uh, you know, good quality training in their yeah. police academy. You think about the... The anxiety, the fear, and the adrenaline that that police officer is going to feel going into that situation, that's all real stuff. And uh, a lot of people forget police officers are are human beings. We're not machines. You know, we feel all these same things. You know, obviously the more prepared you are, the more you've invested in your training, in your physical fitness, and in your health, the more confident you're going to be in that situation but, again, that's not everyone. That's like the few and far between of us that, that put in that extra time um, to make sure that we, uh, we're the ones that come out on top. Yeah, you know, I saw, uh, I saw a video not too long ago. A couple of police officers were trying to make an arrest of this guy. I think it was like at like a McDonald's or something, and they were on a parking lot. And uh, they're struggling to, to try to control this guy. Mm-hmm. And you could tell that they had either very, very limited or no ground training uh, as part of their their police department's defensive tactics program. So no two-man takedown, which is uh, one of the things that, that we teach, and uh, their arrest and control, it was just like, it was just all over the place. And when you don't have the techniques to apply, you have to go to what you do have, which is, oh, well, I have an aspartame. And so the aspartame comes out and you see a guy starting to get hit with an aspartame because that police officer has never been trained on how to control a guy uh, with, you know, with jujitsu. Yeah. You know, everybody talks about, uh, you know, the use of tasers. Well, not all police officers are issued tasers. Yeah. Here's another thing. Tasers don't always work. Tasers miss and stuff like that. Yeah, tasers miss where they don't, you don't get a good connection. You know, I had a, a, a guy that, uh, I used to work with. He responded to a call for this. Uh, I think the guy was like drunk and disorderly or whatever. And he walked in, and the officer had a taser. And the guy put up his hands and said, "I'm gonna fuck you up." And this was an officer who uh, would be the one to complain during defensive tactics training each year, like, "How long is this gonna take?" Or he wouldn't put any kind of effort into the techniques, and you know, obviously didn't want to be there. And he felt very empowered because he had a taser. So he pulls his taser out and discharges it. One prong hits the guy like in the chest and the other one hit the guy in the belt. Well, because it hit him in the belt, it didn't have a good connection. Didn't work. And the guy walked up, punched the officer right in the face and dropped him. Yeah. So, you know, here's someone that put too much reliance on their Batman belt instead of on the techniques that, you know, we had given them in their training um, or even sought out on his own to get additional training. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it blows my mind. And I know for many police officers, it's an ego thing. You know, they don't want to be put in a bad situation that they don't feel comfortable in. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, when you go through the academy, you have no choice. You have to go through those bad situations. You have to roll with the instructors. You got to go through the defensive tactics classes. And... Uh, you know, that's the way it is. But once you're out, you don't have to do that training anymore. Yeah, exactly. There's no mandatory PT. Um, there's no mandatory defensive tactics training, you know, several times a week. Now it's just, what are you going to do? You know, the vast majority of them don't do anything. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough situation. Um, because you, you've got to have people, you got to fill the job. 
in order to have police officers to respond to calls. Um, so you can't, you know, try to build a police department of, you know, the most athletic, strongest, you know, men and women uh, that are out there because, you know, you can only hire the, the ones that want to be police officers. Yeah. And uh, want to apply. Not them, yeah, <laughs> not all of them fit that mold. Yeah. You got to look, you know, everybody's capable of learning defensive tactics, everybody. Some people, you know, need it more than others. But, uh, you know, if you're going to be a police officer, you're going to put on that badge and go out there and, you know, serve your community, then, uh, and you expect to be able to come home alive at the end of every shift, you know, that's something that you really need to consider is putting in that extra time in the weight room and, you know, on the mats to, to learn to, you know, be effective in your, the execution of your job and in defending yourself so that you get home to your, your wife, your kids, your girlfriend, boyfriend, mom, dad, whatever. I think you have a really great perspective on a lot of a lot of these things, and I'm glad we got to talk about it because yeah, well, it's very you know, important. I've been training martial arts since I was 15. I'm 41 now, and I've been a police officer for almost 19 years. You know, I, I've had a lot of uh, experiences. Uh, I've done a lot of growing. I've got to uh, train with a lot of different people. I've got to see a lot of different things, and so it kind of gives me a, a pretty good perspective of defensive tactics as it applies to law enforcement and and you know real life you know just yeah. knowing how to defend yourself thanks so. so much for being on the show and i think this That's is problem, i think this is great thank you so much and um we'll do a live version soon hopefully awesome hope to uh, get you back in the states and back training here again thanks man i'll talk to you soon <laughs> all right see ya thanks thanks again to mike for being on the show it was really great talking to him about the jujitsus and our thoughts and our philosophies and who we are in this in this infinite existence. Once again, Trek Jitsu is brought to you by Matrix. Please go to youtube.com slash show your role to check out the first that I know of jujitsu streaming service. We're looking for your footage, so if you want to submit it, please send it to Matrix Video at gmail.com. And of course, thank you again to my friends at Waves Overhead for supplying all of the music for this podcast. I'm going to go ahead and play their song right now. The theme song for Trek Jitsu is To Make Amends. To support them, go to wavesoverhead.bandcamp.com and enjoy their music.